I've never really said this publicly, um, but I will. Uh, Rick Joyner is a Luciferian. There's there's no question about that in my mind, because I have I know someone uh, that actually uh, was at his house was um, very very familiar with the Joyners, uh, was actually a, a nanny for them for a number of years, and. Um, saw something at their house and, and brought it you know, Ju- to Julie's attention because there was a, a piece of paper uh, that she saw lying on the coffee table, and it, it was an invitation, a very, very fancy invitation for them to be initiated. This was through the, I think, through the Knights of Malta into the Luciferian light. Well, she saw the oh. word Luciferian, and she became alarmed. And so she said, Julie, what is this? And Julie was like, oh, oh, no, 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 that's that's not what you're thinking about at all. You know, that's that's not Lucifer as in Satan. That's, you know, Lucifer as in light. And, and like, she, she completely um, <laughs> <laughs> explained it away. But I know this person. I know that they would not make that up um, at all. And there was another witness that was there as well that that saw that piece of paper. And actually, Julie was uh, bringing out her her gown or whatever to show this person. That and um, she lived way up in the mountains in North Carolina at that time, up in a little place uh, called Moravian Falls, very little place, a whistle stop really. And um, she had brought this beautiful sequined gown out to show uh, my friend, and uh, my friend was like, "Where on earth are you going to wear that?" I mean, she's way up in the mountains. It looks, you know, looks like something that, uh, you know, all sequined. And and so anyway, that's and you know, Julie said, "Oh, it's for that for that ceremony." Oh, well, how blind can you be? I mean. It, how blind can people be? It's so very. easy. Yeah, very. Now, it's so easy to be deceived, and uh, to see something like that that says Luciferian, and then you you want to believe it's something else because you can't you can't believe that maybe your idol, uh, the person you're worshiping, uh, can have any faults. So that's the reason that God says He doesn't want us to have idols. It's another reason why God says, cursed is the man that puts his trust in man. We put no trust in human beings because human beings will let us down all the time. We put our trust in God. Uh, but now how many years were you there if affiliated with Rick Joyner? Um, actually, I'm trying to think. I moved there the same year that Princess Diana died. And I think that was 97. Yeah, not and, 97, yeah. Yeah, and I remember going to a service, um, and actually I write about that on my, my website, which I think would be fascinating for anyone to read, because it's the service that was um, the new millennium. It was uh, There was a three-day conference over uh, in the, the last one. The last service of that conference was on New Year's Eve, uh, you know, of 2000. So it was very interesting service. That was actually one of, if not the, no, it was one of the very last services I ever attended there. So I left uh, just very early in the year 2000. Okay. And um, then I subsequently moved from Charlotte up into to Wilkesboro, which is where they were living. And I remember thinking at the time, because I had make, made a break and I felt, you know, that the Lord had told me not to even step a toe over the threshold of that building ever again. And um, so I left, and, but I, you know, I knew that the Lord was moving me up to Wilkesboro, and I thought, why on earth would the Lord move me up to there, you know, right, right where he's living? But um, so I... You know, even though I did brush shoulders with some of the people for a while, uh, I was completely out of that, out of that movement, completely and totally out. I made a very clean break. Yeah. Um, tell the listeners a little bit about M- Moravian Falls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, there's so much there that it's hard to kind of encapsulate that, but. Moravian Falls, originally, it's a very small town. It was originally uh, settled by the Moravians, and uh, Count Zinzendorf, he bought a 
acre, no, I can't remember how many acres, but a huge, huge uh, parcel of land he had up in the mountains in North Carolina. And this place actually, Moravian Falls, was actually the capital of their publishing industry. Um, and they published a newspaper there called The Morning Star. Now, this oh. is Count Zinzendorf and the Moravians. And so Rick Joyner attached some special uh, spiritual significance to this land. And he um, wanted to build a prophetic retreat up there. And the way it was described to us, it was like utopia. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I remember, you know, just staring years. at him all glassy eyed, like, oh, that sounds yeah. so awesome. Because, you know, all these prophetic people that were so misunderstood, we were all going to go up to the mountains and it was all going to be, you know, we were all going to hold hands and sing kumbaya. And, you know, life glassy-eyed. was going to be wonderful. Glassy eyed. Yeah, glassy eyed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And. So yeah. he would, and he was aggressively fundraising for this and saying, oh, yeah, you know. He, he has been for years. Yeah, well, yeah. And interestingly enough, there's nothing up there. <laughs> nothing. He makes it sound like they have this big, there is nothing up there. I lived there. I know people there. I'm in contact, actually, with people in that area. There's nothing there. <laughs> I just, I, you know, I, I am actually moved from that area just three years ago. So I know what's oh, up there. Yeah. And it's nothing. And people call me a liar over that. They they will they'll declare uphill and down because he makes it sound so believable. He does. It's, in fact he almost makes me believe it and I know that there's nothing up there. And you know, I'll listen to him sometimes um recently you been believed doing this it when book. you were there. You believed it. I until did. You saw yes, it yourself, I completely right? believed it. And finally, I went up there because there was a, a lodge on that property which he does not own. Um, the Bazels own that. And I went up because they were having a little woman's retreat. And I went up basically not because of the woman's retreat, but I wanted to see for myself what was up there, and because I was starting to have some major, major questions. And I remember just being dumbfounded because what was there was, you know, huge homes by the, the Morning Star elite. There, there was nothing up there that for ministry wise. Yeah, like he was at building all. Moravian Falls all right. He was he was building those mansions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, and here he would talk about all this stuff, and he talked about that lodge as if they owned it. They did not own it. In fact, I, I, the, you know, I spoke to the owners. They, they, yeah, it, it, complete farce. And now how many so, mansions were there? Well, at that time, uh, he had a, a large home himself. Then he was building his home, which was 13,000 square feet. Yeah. Um, and so after that, more homes have been been added up, uh, you know, up there. I think Steve Thompson, uh, which was his kind of second in command, had a home up there, a large home. And, um, you know, there were some other other homes as well. But uh, he actually has had a falling out with Steve Thompson, so I understand he's no longer there. But, yeah, it was all their homes. And here he was. He was, you know, even in Canada, uh, he was fundraising in all different countries, and people were giving money left, right, and center. But really, there was nothing up there, nothing. And and the other thing that, that really annoyed me, um, because it's just so deceptive, he bought all these he bought all this land up there huge parcels of land and really if anyone has the proclivity to do so uh, you can actually see all the land um you can go into their um archives and stuff the the land registry at in Wilkesboro um and and see the land that he owned um and but he made it all he developed it into little parcels of land and then he sold it <laughs> so what he was doing was buying up this whole mountain yeah, and, other uh, people's donations and previous. other people's donations, and then he was, you know, uh, had a developer come in, develop it all, and then he sold, resold the lots. So that's what yeah. he did. Yeah, well, that sounds familiar. I think we, we've probably heard of many pastors doing that too, ministry, uh-huh. enriching themselves off the hard work and uh, offerings of uh, good people. You know, there's some people, of course, the body of Christ is made up of many good people. Uh, Well, and, you know, and and it's interesting because he um, uh, 
kept saying, this is where God wants us and, you know, oh, okay. uh, all that. But then he ran, had a run-in with the local officials over taxes because he didn't yeah. want to pay taxes. He he was trying to say that he's a nonprofit. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, he didn't want to pay taxes on his personal plane because he's a pilot or any of that stuff because he said that, oh, it was all, you know, tied in with the church. Oh, yeah. And uh, so he ran into problems with the county, and they, they weren't very sympathetic towards him. So all of a sudden, he pulled out, and he went to Charlotte. Well, does God change his mind? Yeah. You know? No. The God, of course, their God does. But I well, I, yeah. I, I enjoyed your, your stories, your articles uh, on your website, Deception Bites, especially when you, you know, you're talking about the glassy-eyed uh, and your stories about uh, the prophetic. So yeah. I tell, I share with the listeners a little bit your your testimony there about uh, being so drawn into this whole. How did they get you? And how did they keep you for three years? Well, and they didn't really keep me for the whole three years because I kind of had fallen fallen out i immediately when i got there i got there probably may uh around may in in 97 and then that fall i enrolled in their ministry school so i was part of their ministry school and probably after that full year i started having like something was just wrong and something was really wrong in my spiritual life too because i just I knew that there was something really radically wrong, but it, it I think people underestimate the power of the demonic influence there because it really does draw you in. The very first time I ever went to Morningstar, I remember this. I literally started shaking from head to toe when I walked through the door. When I passed that threshold of that door, I literally started shaking. And I remember the person that I was with saying, oh, you know, it's the glory and I knew it wasn't. I mean, I knew that I knew that it was not that, and I did not know what was happening to me. But I knew that whatever was happening to me was not God. Yeah. And so I remember coming in and sitting down and, and looking around, and my first inclination, and I don't know why I didn't go with that and run like the wind, but yeah. my very first inclination was, this place is evil. Yeah. And when the worship music started, I had a very difficult time with the worship music because I was so involved in worship, and I, that was such a love of mine. And there was no purity. There was no um, – it was like being at a rock concert. And it, it, I'm yeah. not talking about the quality of the music. I'm talking. I'm not talking about the actual music, and and or I'm talking about the spirit behind it. There was something so wrong and so evil about it, and I really did have a very difficult time my, on my first um, my first visit there. But I had all my people, uh, friends in Canada, saying, "Oh no, this is this is God. This is God wants you there because you have a prophetic gift, and and yeah. God wants that developed, and yeah. you are right where you need to be." And so I kept. Uh, you know, I was having this big crisis, you know, in my spirit because I'm thinking this is wrong. But then I'm thinking, well, there must be something wrong with me because yeah. nobody else is having a problem right. here. So right. it must be me, and this must be just so holy and so, hot, you know, spiritually advanced that I just can't deal with it. Yeah. And that's how I kind of dealt with that crisis in, you know. And so I kind of went along with it, and after the service, uh, I went up to um, somebody there and said, oh, you've, you've got to come up to these, you've got to, you know, go to the prophetic booths. And I thought, what are you talking about? And sure enough, I looked, and they were booth? setting up all these booths, like like a, you know, fortune teller like booth. professional. Yeah, and they were setting up all these booths with dividers in between and everything, and you went up and you got a number, and that number told you which booth to go to. And um, you'd go into the booth, and there'd be three people sitting there, um, and they would prophesy over you in turn, and oh. then you'd get up and leave. And oh. it's interesting enough, interestingly enough, I ended up being one of those that would prophesy over others and, and even did so at some of their conferences. Oh. So, yeah, I got really, really pulled into it. And so, you know, after after the service, I, you know, took a number and I went to get prophetic ministry. And the words that I received were so, 
and I can't remember exactly, but it, it literally was putting my spirit to rest. Like, yeah, yeah, this is just me. This is where God wants me. I'm supposed to be here. And this is just me. I just can't deal with how spiritually advanced this atmosphere is. And it's interesting that that spiritual elitism is very much a part of that movement and very much a part yeah. of those types of churches because yeah. I began to think that uh, once I did sort of relax into it and um, that demonic influence took over, um, I literally thought I was more spiritual than everyone else. Oh, I really yes, honestly thought right. that and believed it. And yeah. see, people did come to me and try to warn me, but I thought, why should I listen to you? You're beneath me spiritually. Yeah, That's yeah, what I would yeah. be thinking. Oh, yeah, I know. And, you know, uh, I really believed that. That was not just, I mean, I really believed that. I was special. I was called. Oh, I was yes. elite. You're I was anointed. chosen. Oh, and, yes. And, you know, and God spoke to me. And, oh, yes. Um, and, you know, these words that I give, oh, they are right from oh, God. And yes. so I believed it. Yeah. I bought it lock, stock, and barrel. And literally when the Lord brought me out of that, I, I had to go through a, a complete crisis again because I realized, like, okay, uh, I'm not anybody. Um, yeah. I'm not special. Yeah. I'm not, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, I know. <laughs> it, it's a hard awakening. But, oh, yeah. And it's interesting because these people are, you know, they can they can call on heaven and bring down heaven, but they can't balance their checkbooks or keep a job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, people's oh, lives. Oh, no, you can't work. No, Ooh, no, no. You can't. <laughs> exactly. Nobody's called to work. No. Exactly. <laughs> You're called to live off of others. That's exactly right. And, you know, I couldn't, I just couldn't understand why my life was just spiraling downward when I when yeah. I was there. And, um, you know, I of course it was. I was living off of spiritual fluff. And, yeah. you know, cotton candy. I, did, I had no solid meat at all. And interestingly enough, I stopped reading my Bible. I didn't need my Bible. Oh, what did I need oh. my Bible for? Everybody told me what I needed to know. Oh, wow. You know, that and, and really once dangerous. that once that Bible was out of my hands, that that's it. I mean, geez, I was done for. Once I stopped reading my Bible, uh, so it, it, it disarmed you. me. It completely disarmed me. Did they did they not read the Bible at how oh, many times no. a week did they have church services there? Yes, but I never saw a Bible there ever. Never. Oh. No. In fact, interesting I and I described this in one of my articles um saying that I never saw a Bible there, but I did see one time a man bring a Bible and was sitting reading his Bible. They came, uh, the the ushers came, one on either side, and strong-armed him out of the building. He was sitting there. He was quiet. He was compliant. Um, all he was doing was reading his Bible, and they came, and they strong-armed him out of there. Oh. And that and was yet, to wake you up? Oh, yeah. I mean, all when these things that, were... All these things were, you know, uh, accumulating in my in my in my spirit, and I was thinking, okay, there's something not right here. But I was so there, there was so much demonic influence there that it almost kept you anesthetized and yeah. made you um, kind of reason it out. And everybody that I knew was was into this. Absolutely everyone I knew, no normal Christians. And so to me, you know, it, it's like being in the land of Oz and, yeah. you know, you're seeing all the, the colored horses and tiny men singing oom pa pa and you're thinking, well, it's normal for here yeah. um, because it's all you know. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of like that. I mean, it was my environment and that's what that's, I was That's exactly what to you're and, saying. It, it's so true because I think probably – you know, some of our listeners, and I'm not saying most, but we've all been through those kind of experiences where, uh, you're, yeah, you're living in the land of Oz, and you don't know a, any normal people. You know, very few normal people, but thank God he eventually brings them into into your life. Yeah, uh, and uh, you don't realize. I mean, it took me a long time uh, to realize just how much pride I had. Uh, when I was in the Word of Faith movement, it was horrible pride. And uh, you don't realize that you have all that pride until, you know, like you said, God rocks your world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he rocked my world for a few years, starting back in 1997. And, uh, you know, I couldn't believe it. I had a lot of repenting to do. 
uh, and, but I thank God you know, for he rescued me from all that foolishness. Amen. And trying to build a kingdom that is not the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. But how easily we can be deceived. Very easily. And it, it sometimes annoys me when people say to me things like, well, why would you ever believe all that stuff? They don't realize the pull of it. And, well, um, you want to be accepted. You're accepted and you're loved and you're important. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a it's an experiential type thing. I yeah. I had grown up in a faith that was so uh legalistic and this was the complete opposite. And it was everything that I hated. Uh, see, I hated all that legalism and, and do this and don't do that. I'm not talking about true biblical uh, following God's laws. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a legalism like as in um, you can't wear makeup and you got to grow your hair and you got to, you know, that. And I was rebelling yeah. against that. And this was everything opposite. It was a faith that I could literally feel and I could feel yeah, good could and feel. I could get yeah. all tingly and, uh, and it, it was yeah. trance producing. The worship, you know, I literally. Literally, you would go into like a trance, and you know I tell people they this. They look like I, they're in a trance if you ever look at. They some really of those, are, truly, uh, and you know I, I describe program. an experience where we were all worshiping, and I literally lost time when I was at Morning Star. I literally yeah. would lose time, and yeah. I would almost come to in a service and think, "Wow, where was I?" Yeah. And um, that was it, this was a situation like that. We were listening to the worship, and you know, everyone well, it was, was a form of hypnotism. It absolutely was. It absolutely was. And I remember kind of coming to in the service and looking around, and everybody had that. You know, they were just uh, in rapture. They, you know, their hands were in the air. They were swaying. Everyone had their eyes shut. They were just out of it. And I remember looking around and thinking, what is happening to me? And I suddenly heard what they were singing. And this is what they were singing. Here comes, it was a prophetic song, and Leonard, who is the head of the worship, was singing, Here Comes the Sun, all dressed in black. And um, and then he what? said, oh, yes. And then he said, oh, stinking death, we drink your cup. <gasps> then, yeah, what? and then went into yeah. Then he went into the Beatles song, "Little Darling." You know, here comes the sun. Oh and my! And everybody word. in that place was out of it. And I had a friend that was standing behind me. His name's <sighs> Doy, and he has he has since come out of that movement. And I turned around, and he was just lost. I mean, he looked like he was completely drugged and out of it. And I slapped him, and I said, oh. you know, I poked him and slapped him because I couldn't get him to come too. And I said, Doy, Doy. And I, you know, I kept, I kept poking him and, and slapping him. And finally, it's like he, it was like he was waking up from, from anesthesia, honestly. And he was like, uh, uh, what? And then he got mad at me. He said, what? What do you want? And so I said, listen, listen to what they're saying. Listen. And he, it was like he almost slipped back into it. And I poked oh. him again. And I said, listen. And, so he started listening, and he heard what they were saying. He heard the same thing as, as me, that he, they were repeating these things. And um, uh, he grabbed me, and we ran out of there. And wow. outside, we were standing there. He said, what are we a part of? I mean, we were horrified. It, but it was so strange because everybody else was out of it. Yeah. yeah. You could see it. Uh, they they do play some of their services on uh, on God TV, and uh, you could see how these people are acting. They're acting strange, weird. They they look like a bunch of zombies uh, in this what, what they call a church service. You can see it for yourself. It's and, it, yeah, and people say, oh, it's you know they're lost in the spirit. No, they're they're being mind controlled. Yeah, I literally lost time, and you know I have I have worshipped the Lord in my own time and felt you know just an absolute bliss before the Lord. But it's completely different. I'm aware of my surroundings. I'm aware of uh, my body. I, I feel like I'm in complete control. But I I I know that the Lord is um, speaking with me or whatever. It's it's completely different. It has a completely different quality to it uh, than this because this was something. This was almost like being in a trance. Uh, and and not having control over your yeah. your own body and and so forth, um, that that's not God. That's no. just not God. 